lunchtime lecture. Uh, it's proudly sponsored by Tacoma Strategies for the month of September, which is our Heritage Month in South Africa. So thanks, David, for joining us for Heritage Month. Um, today we have David Hol Holwell. Um, he is an Associate Professor, Senior Lecturer in Applied and Environmental Geology at the University of Leicester. He received a BSc in Geology from Durham University, followed by an MSc in Mining Geology at the Camborne School, School of Mines, where he first dabbled in South African geology, undertaking a research project on the Marensky Reef with Grant Cawthorn. After a short period in engineering geology, he returned to Bushveld Research to complete a PhD on the Platte Reef with Anglo-American, based at Cardiff University with Ian MacDonald. Since then, he has worked as an exploration geologist and consultant, and for the past 11 years has been based at the University of Leicester, where his research focuses on magmatic and hydrothermal ore deposits and applying knowledge of the processes that form these deposits to exploration and mining models through a multidisciplinary disciplinary approach of fieldwork, mineralogical, petrological, geochemical, and isotopic analysis. His primary research centers around magmatic nickel, copper, cobalt, PGE deposits across the world. So thank you so much, David, for joining us once again. Um, over to you. You are on mute. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> OK, uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, OK, good to be back. Um, so uh, this talk is uh, going to give you a little uh, overview of a, a project that we've been working on. Uh, on the Katumba copper uh, uh, deposit uh, in Zambia. Uh, I'm going to say this is largely the work of um, a student who I'll uh, introduce in a moment. Um, and this is work that we've been doing with our, our partners, Consolidated Mining uh, and Investments. Um, and so uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, Katumba, which is an IOCG deposit, which is an iron oxide copper gold deposit but one that has been uh, undertaken uh, super gene enrichment. Um, so it's sort of a, an enriched IOCG, which is a little bit more uh, unusual. Uh, so this is who we've been uh, working with. So uh, the uh, Kate in the middle there, um, she's been doing, uh, what I'm gonna present is pretty much her, her master's work uh, on uh, the mineralogy um, of this uh, deposit. So we've been working out there uh, with Daryl Blanks as well. Um, the team from uh, CMI, including Simon uh, Perkis, Craig Bailey, Emma Parker and others. Um, and also this project um, was in association with uh, Zeiss um, Microscopy in Cambridge. Uh, Romana Khan who's been involved with that and I'll explain uh, the various uh, uh, contributions as we go through. Uh, but Kate, who I think is in the audience, uh, this is mostly uh, from her, her master's work. Now, before we go on to Katumba, I thought I'd, I'd give you a little bit of background on IOCGs, if, if you are unfamiliar with them. Uh, so very briefly, they are quite a, um, a, a diverse set of ore deposits, and for a while they were a, an IOCG was a bit of a bucket term for anything that didn't really fit in any other deposit. Uh, type and uh, there are a lot of a lot of variety to them, but there is uh, a, a bit of a consensus growing as to how these things form. This is um, uh, the Ernest Henry deposit um, in the Cloncurry district of, of Queensland. The ore body here is this uh, sort of red stained shear zone, which is coming across uh, the open pit there. We've got underground workings coming in there. Um, so they're pretty diverse. You can actually think of them a little bit like porphyry deposits in that they are large scale sort of um, high tonnage copper gold deposits uh, with chalcopyrite, pyrite and gold with some iron oxide, obviously. Uh, but there can be a large range of buy and co products, not necessarily, but, but there often is. This is one of the more beautiful ones that have come across. Um, this is the E1 deposit in uh, Queensland. Uh, which the gang mineral, so that we've got the chalcopyrite and pyrite there, with gang being um, barite, calcite and fluorite in these veins. Uh, and if you look across the world, they are uh, well distributed, mostly in uh, Precambrian terrain. So some of the big ones out there in Queensland that I mentioned, the Gawler Craton in South Australia has the Biggie Olympic Dam, but other notable ones that you may have uh, heard of, Bionobo uh, out here, um, 
the Carajás province um, in Brazil, there's ones in, uh, in all continents really. Uh, and then it, coming into Africa, we've got Gelb McGrain in uh, Mauritania. Uh, Palabora is sometimes uh, called an IOCG. And we've also got a little group of them in the Lufilian Arc in Zambia, which I will focus on. Uh, these ones out here, by the way, um, in the Chilean Andes, they are uh, classed as IOCGs, but they're a lot younger and they're sort of formed um, in this sort of more subduction uh, setting. But most IOCGs are in old uh, Proterozoic Archean terrains. Um, and there's a broad diversity uh, in their styles, but if, if we're trying to generalize, they are structurally controlled hydrothermal deposits, and they're hosted by shear zones, breaches, basically zones of pressure drop, sites of fluid mixing where there's plenty of permeability. Um, and we'll show you that that is the case for Katumba um, as well. There's generally large and multiple pre-or stages of alteration, and you get an, an ore mineralogy of pyrite, chalcopyrite, um, and iron oxides. Uh, the gang is uh, fluor uh, quartz poor, um, so for for um, hydrothermal deposits, and they are unusually quartz poor. And along with the copper and gold, there might be silver, uranium, uh, rare earths, of course, with Olympic Dam, but maybe cobalt, arsenic, selenium, tellurium, and pretty much the entire periodic table in some of those deposits. And this gives you an idea of the general sort of copper gold nature. Usually we're talking around about 1% copper. For these deposits. Most of them, here's the big ones in here, Carajas, Ernest Henry, Olympic Dam, all around about 1% copper and about half a gram per tonne uh, gold. The Zambian ones are a little bit more gold poor, uh, but have similar amounts of uh, copper. And then there are a few end members up here, which are quite gold rich in Australia. And then we're going down to some possibly magmatic end members, Palabora or Keep, maybe. Um, but these are the, these are the sort of general um, uh, grades that we're looking at. And you get widespread regional alteration, usually, uh, but not always, an early widespread sodic calcic alteration phase, and then a subsequent potassic iron alteration phase. And you may have more of those, uh, you may have several episodes. These are examples, uh, again, from Australia, where you've got this classic red rock alteration, which is uh, the potassic iron alteration, and then you get an ore stage after that. So this is an example of rocks that have uh, been uh, altered. So we've got a breccia here, um, uh, which has then been uh, mineralized with chalcopyrite, pyrite, uh, and magnetite. But there's a broad diversity in their styles. Um, so that is a function of different fluid sources. Um, so they can be magmatic. Usually there's a magmatic fluid involved, not always, but usually. Uh, it can be mafic derived, but more likely uh, felsic derived. Uh, there can be metamorphic fluids in there, maybe basinal fluids uh, as well. The fluid pathways add to that diversity because you generally get one of the fluids sourced from a magma, but the deposit is often not quite associated with it spatially. So there's a lot of transport of those fluids through the crust. They can interact with different country rocks, pick up elements along the way, drop them out, reach redox boundaries. Um, and we get fluid mixing as well with various different fluid sorts. And all of this builds up um, to a lot of different uh, inputs uh, and variables, which means you get a lot of diversity. And these um, uh, images down here are from four deposits, all from the same district um, around Cloncurry in, in Queensland, uh, but they obviously look very different. We've got a breccia there, and we've got um, sediment uh, replacement, we've got veins, and then we've got total replacement, and huge um, bits of uh, fluorite in this one um, at Monaco. And that variety of styles is a little bit challenging for exploration because if you uh, go out um, in the district of Ernest Henry and look for another Ernest Henry, like a, a red rock altered breccia, um, you're probably not going to pick up a Monokoff or an Eloise. Um, so it does, it does make it a little bit different, but the alteration styles can be uh, at least a first pass. Um, that potassic iron alteration can be particularly useful because it produces magnetite, um, which you can then use as a, a nice um, uh, target um, with magnetic anomalies. But obviously that is not necessarily the ore stage. The ore stage fluids are only little pinpricks 
within that stage that's earlier been altered. So Ernest Henry there is on the biggest um, anomaly, but we've got um, deposits here. And actually Monokoff is on one of the smallest magnetic anomalies, but it is on a magnetic anomaly. And structural corridors are obviously important too. So generally for IOCGs, we're looking at Proterozoic terrains, um, felsic magmatism, uh, like anorogenic A-type granites, um, major structural corridors, episodes of early um, alteration and uh, some magnetite as well. So, off to Katumba now um, in central Zambia. Um, so, a little map of uh, uh, parts of Zambia. Um, so, we've got Lusaka down there, this is the Kariba Dam. So, there's the Zimbabwe of Kalahari Kraton, the Zambezi Belt, uh, the Mwembeshi Shear Zone coming through here, and that's separating the Zambezi Belt. Uh, from this uh, Katangan supergroup. So all the um, uh, copper belt deposits around here and then sort of in between that and the Mwembeshi shear zone uh, we've got a lot of granitoids including the massive hook granite and it is around this hook granite um, that our um, uh, Katumba district, uh, the Mumbwa district of IOCGs is hosted. So generally um, this area so in the Zambezi belt and also um, in the Katanga um, uh, rift around about from about 888 to 860 we get rifting and deposits of these sediments and um, last time I spoke um, this is when Manali um, gets intruded um, and then around about 550 to 520 the Pan-African uh, shunts everything up uh, folds everything um, and we've got the Lufillian arc produced there the Zambezi belts all closed and we've got intrusion of granites like the hook granite now, if we come in to this, here's the Hook Batholith, and you can see it's a couple of hundred kilometers across. It's intruded into uh, Katangan supergroup. And around the margins in orange here are some later stage cyanites. Now, these late stage cyanites seem to be associated with IOCG style mineralization. And um, so this is the Mumbwa district, Katumba um, is in here. There's the town of Mumbwa. Uh, and we go down towards the Mwembeshi Shear Zone, there's the Matala Dome. So anyone who's been uh, watching the um, um, what James Mwali um, uh, Memorial Symposium uh, on the uh, sediment hosted copper belt, some of the um, transects that they've been showing and sections across the copper belt tend to come down to uh, and sort of finish around about the Matala Dome. And these are Katangan supergroup sediments that were intruded into here. Uh, but we're a little bit uh, far away from the main copper belt. But actually, Zambia's first copper mine was not in the copper belt, it was in this district, and it's the Hippo Mine, um, which is right next to the Kafui River. So the Kafui River comes up here. Um, we're actually inside the Kafui National Park here. Um, Katumba is just outside it, the boundary of the National Park is around about there. Um, and you can go and visit the old mine workings. There's a nice little lodge just by the river there that you can stay in, uh, called Hippo Lodge. And this is the Hippo Mine. Uh, and we went to visit it. Uh, and this image here is obviously a leopard. That's actually uh, was there when we went there. It's just, just over here, checking out some of the old waste dumps, uh, looking for nice, pretty green and blue rocks. Um, so the, the wildlife has taken over uh, at the Hippo Mine. But that was Zambia's first copper mine, a little bit of uh, history there. Uh, and then if we move away from uh, Hippo out uh, towards the west and come to the main district um, of IOCG mineralization, this is where Katumba is, uh, another, another prospect, uh, Sugarloaf. Um, and we can see that there are some north-south trending faults here. That is a key control on where these mineral deposits are. Um, and the intrusive rocks here into the Katangan supergroup are quartz feldspar porphyry granites related to the hook granite, and we've got cyanites um, as well. So we've um, got a number of those uh, IOCG prospects um, in that region. Uh, and if we have a look at the uh, uh, the profile through the whole body itself, I said it's a super gene enriched deposit. So those images that I showed you of IOCGs are classic sort of hypergene sulfide deposits. What we've got here is an IOCG deposit like that, but then has undergone 
uh, super gene enrichment. So we can see intersections here of a few hundred meters of one, two percent uh, copper uh, within this uh, super gene zone. So that's a rough uh, depth of super gene profile, that um, purple wiggly line there. Uh, so a little bit of uh, uh, history. So the, the, the hippo mine was uh, opened up um, just at the end of the 19th century, uh, sable antelope as well. And there were a number of discoveries in the area which was uh, referred to as the big concession. Um, so that included uh, some deposits like Sugarloaf, Lulu, uh, and most of these are associated with these cyanites, but some are actually hosted within the Katangan supergroup sediments as well. But it's a, a little copper district. Um, but interest sort of fell away in the area because then the, the, the main copper belt um, up at the, the border with uh, the DRC was discovered and a lot of the um, exploration and mining obviously uh, focused there. Uh, but then in 2004 there were some geophysical surveys by BHP and Blackthorn. Uh, they identified a number of prospects. NSA involved with, with some of this uh, as well, with intrepid mines merging with Blackthorn. Uh, and a resource was defined a few years ago um, which was uh, 20, uh, about 28 million tonnes at 2.2% copper with a cut off of 1%. Uh, since then, the licence was taken up by uh, Consolidated Mines and Investment through uh, Vulcan Copper. Um, and we're at the stage now where there's a resource and there's plenty of drill core there, um, uh, but it has not been mined yet. So our little story from uh, a research side, uh, we have been working with CMI and, and consolidated nickel mines as well uh, at Manali for a few years. That was the, the, the talk that I gave last, last, um, uh, last month um, with uh, Daryl's project on, on Manali. And we've since uh, done a few master's projects and this year um, just completed Kate Cannon. Um, did a master's project on, on Katumba. So this was supported by CNR, CMI. Uh, she also did an internship with Zeiss. So I'm going to show you some of the uh, images and data that we've got from some of the quantitative mineralogy that we did at their facility uh, in Cambridge in the UK. So Katumba is a complex ore body and we can look at this in three uh, ways. We can look at the geology, the alteration and the mineralization. So geology wise, we've got a fault zone. So this is now looking sort of west to east um, up that north south trending fault zone. Along the fault zone, we've got breccias. This is classic IOCG stuff. Um, and the orange there is the granite, which is intruded into the blue Katangan supergroup sediments. And then we've got late stage cyanites coming through now associated with those is a load of alteration. Again, classic IOCG style. So we've actually got quite a few stages of, of alteration, uh, which is zoned. Uh, and the mineralization, we've got a hypergene um, zone towards the base, uh, but then we've got this supergene enrichment zone, which is coming down. And there is a nice sort of boundary um, at the eastern side, which is formed by that uh, Katumba fault. So everything's at the fault and to the west of it. We've got high grade super gene copper here, and we've also got a little zone uh, of gold there as well, which is puzzling us, but I'll come to that. So the host rocks are those granite uh, quartz porphyry granites, cyanites, um, feldspar porphyry cyanites, and also uh, breccias. And they've been variably altered. Um, there's a paper that came out last year um, on Katumba and some of the uh, deposits in the, in the district by Milani et al. Um, and that defined uh, six different alteration stages. We've got a magnetite one with apatite, biotite. We've got a potassic one, uh, which we can see in there. Uh, we've got carbonate, hematite, sericite, uh, and carbonate veins. And the carbonate alteration actually um, produces, um, so it's an, an iron manganese carbonate, but the, the manganese staining on the cores means that any cores that have been left out, uh, they've oxidized a little bit and are, are kind of black in color. Um, you, you flip them over in the core tray, isn't there? Actually, they, they, they then look like this again, but it's quite an easy way to map and log that um, carbonate alteration, which is actually quite important because if I put this um, log up. This is one of Kate's logs. Um, so we've got copper grades there uh, and gold uh, as well. 
Um, and here we've got the alteration styles. So we've got iron oxides, potassic, which is fairly pervasive through everything. But look at the carbonate. And if I highlight where the carbonate alteration is, you'll see that that's where there is no mineralization. So the carbonate alteration kind of buffers that super gene enrichment. Um, so we have zones where we've got carbonate alteration, but we don't see that super gene enrichment. And the other thing you probably notice there is that the gold is not with the copper. So uh, we've got a little disconnect, at least in this super gene uh, zone. Have a look at a few other elements. So we've got most of the copper there. The grades are generally around about 2%, uh, something like that, but they can get up to uh, over 20% in some of the, some of the really high grade uh, zones. Um, gold there, we've got a kick, uh, which is offset from the copper. Silver tends to sit with copper rather than gold. No cobalt really in that super gene zone, so this is not a, a copper cobalt super gene uh, uh, deposit. There's a little bit of cobalt in there, uh, but not a, not a huge amount. Um, but we've got little kicks here of things like tellurium and bismuth uh, as well. The iron there obviously going up as you go towards that uh, leached cap. And because this is a super gene copper deposit, it means that you have some of the most beautiful rocks uh, possible here. So these are the hypergene rocks, which in themselves are pretty uh, spectacular. You've got these uh, huge um, apatites with chalcopyrite and pyrite, and we've got cuprite here and various um, uh, oxidized um, uh, minerals. Uh, and I was taken aback so much by these that when we were there on February the 14th last year, it <laughs> made me do a little tweet uh, about how nice these minerals were. So. Uh, that is maybe a little bit cheesy, but there we go. <laughs> they are beautiful. And these are uh, Kate's thin sections. Again, some of the most beautiful thin sections that you might see. Um, certainly before you put them under the microscope, usually things look colourful once they're down the microscope. These are so beforehand. Um, and we've got those hypergene sulphides, a range of supergene sulphides. And that's what I'm going to go through and, and, and show you because this is what Kate has been um, uh, working on characterising uh, using the Zeiss. Uh, quantitative mineralogy. Uh, I'll mention the gold because uh, we don't quite understand that so maybe someone's got some ideas about that um, and various hybrid zones as well. So um, the mineralogical uh, characterization that we we do uh, is uh, with Zeiss um, and we use their mineralogic uh, software so what happens here is you map entire thin sections using EDX analysis. You can pick pixel size, effectively a step size, um, so that can be five microns, it can be whatever you want to, want to the size of minerals that you want to capture. And then each of those uh, pixels, if you like, um, uh, is analyzed. Um, it's characterized by its stoichiometry, um, we do some matrix corrections, peak deconvolutions, and the stoichiometry is matched to a library of mineral compositions. And we can put in our own tolerances uh, for the various weight percents. And what it gives us is really powerful data with mineral proportions and also element deportment. So in that case, it will tell you in a thin section what percentage of that thin section is, let's say, chalcopyrite, or chalcosite or malachite or any other mineral, but also it will tell you what percentage of your co bulk copper is actually in, so how much copper is in this thin section, but then how much copper, is, what percentage is in chalcopyrite versus malachite versus um, whatever. And so if we go through those uh, stages, so this is the hypergene um, mineralization, so we've got uh, that beautiful uh, appetite there with pyrite and chalcopyrite. These colourful maps that I'll show you, these are the uh, mineralogic maps, um, so mapped in the, the way that I've, I've shown you. So we've got yellow here is pyrite and the red is chalcopyrite. So that's our, our so, and we've got iron oxide there. So that's our classic hypergene um, IOCG style. Uh, we then get to a stage, the next phase, what starts to replace the chalcopyrite is chalcosite. So texturally, we're picking up chalcopyrite being replaced by chalcosite uh, and iron oxides as well as, as pyrite starts to disappear. So that's our sort of first stage. 
and the work that Kate um, did in terms of, of the, the textual analysis uh, picked up the these this sort of continuum of styles as we progress uh, with this oxidation um, and supergene enrichment. Uh, we've got some native copper next, um, not too much, but occasionally a little spectacular bit of uh, native copper. And cuprite. Cuprite is the red there, uh, like the roses are red, cuprite is red. Uh, and malachite's green, here it is. Uh, and that's the next stage. Uh, malachite replacement is one of the most common uh, forms of, of, of ore in that supergene zone. Uh, and in here it's, it's in green. Um, and that's, that's the next stage. And then finally, we also get then replacement of malachite by brochantite. Uh, so malachite, by the way, is um, uh, in fact. Let, let's go back. So chalcosite is a copper. Chalcopyrite is copper iron sulfide. Chalcosite is just uh, copper sulfide. Native copper is copper. Uh, cuprite is copper oxide. And then we start to to get the hydrous phases. Um, so uh, malachite is a hydrated copper carbonate, um, and then brochantite is a copper sulfate. Um, now this was pretty interesting actually because um, uh, previously on the logs that we'd, we'd looked at um, there was pseudomalachite had been identified. Now pseudomalachite, as you can probably guess from its name, um, looks very much like malachite um, but it isn't a carbonate, it's a copper phosphate. Um, so it doesn't fizz with acid whereas malachite does. Um, however, when Kate did the mineralogic analysis, um, there was no phosphates that she found, so she couldn't find any um, uh, pseudomalachite, but there was actually a lot of this brochantite, which actually in the form that it's in looks pretty much like um, the malachite does as well. You can see it here in veins with um, kaolinite. But that was the furthest stage, the most, the most oxidized uh, stage. Now this is cool because we were able to uh, identify these minerals, uh, including making that distinction between uh, the phosphate, which is seemingly not there, and a sulfate. Now that has important implications for how well it might be leached, so that's an important consideration that we, that we identified. Um, and here are some of those maps. These are now showing just the copper phases, okay? Everything else is blacked out, um, or the sulfate actually because we've got pyrite in here. Um, so starting with the hypergene we've got pyrite and chalcopyrite and these pie charts they just show the amount uh, the minerals that copper is hosted by so the percentage so here we've got um, most of it is chalcopyrite. Then we go to the next stage chalcopyrite starts this disappear and it's replaced by chalcosite. Most of the copper is then in chalcosite. Then we've got some chalcosite, cuprite comes in and a little bit of malachite comes in and then we get more malachite and then lots of malachite, no cuprite anymore, no chalcosite and then we get to the point, the final sort of stage is that brochantite there. Um, and if I zoom into a couple of these just to give you a little bit more uh, detail, um, so this is that final stage and you can see little remnants of the malachite there which are finally being replaced by this uh, brochantite. This one here is an example of a hybrid. So we've got in the middle of the zone here where you've got uh, chalcosite and cuprite. Um, but then around the edges here it's starting to be replaced uh, by malachite. So actually that pie chart is uh, proportions of more than one of the stages, if you like. So that's one of, more, one of the ones that we've characterized as a, a hybrid in that case. Uh, but it is showing quite nicely how malachite um, is the one that then replaces uh, the cuprite. Um, so these are the samples uh, with depth uh, that Kate took. So down here we've got hypergene, which is dominated by chalcopyrite, which is red. Uh, then in the sort of transitional uh, zones, we've got that chalcosite up to largely the, the malachite dominant, and then the pinks up here are the brochantite dominant ones. So with this uh, quantitative analysis, we can see uh, the, the, the quantitative proportions of the different minerals as we go uh, up through the section. And there's a little perched hypergene zone up here. That's probably because there's a little bit of carbonate alteration there, which means that the supergene and oxidation has been buffered. Uh, that's quite neat, so we're able to do that uh, and assess the mineralogy in a much more quantitative uh, way. 
we can see as well that as we go through, um, so from hypogene to that final stage, as we uh, go from left to right across here, we are increasing the amount of alteration, if you like. And we're going from uh, the sulfur deportment goes from sulfides in chalcopyrite and pyrite, and then chalcosite, and then it ends up in sulfates, which is what you would expect from an oxidation reaction, um, going into barite um, and brochantite. Uh, the iron uh, ends up in iron oxides as well from the sulfides, uh, and the copper um, assay increases, as you might expect, so from maybe a percent uh, or less in hypogene up to several percent. Now these, these are thin sections which we took to look at the mineralogy, so these are, these are high grade sections anyway, but you can see we're looking at sort of uh, 20 to 30 percent copper in some of those um, sections. Now, um, an IOCG deposit should have iron oxide, it should have copper in it, it should have some gold. Now, um, the Zambian ones are relatively low in gold anyway, um, but they do have some gold. And interestingly, the gold at Katumba is focused in one particular zone, which um, doesn't have any copper in, and it has these uh, unusual textures. So we've got breccias here, and you can see bits of the granite there with the, the quartz. Uh, in it and these uh, sort of banded uh, textures, whether the, it almost looks like a gotten, but it's 100 meters down, uh, whether it could be remnant uh, folding in maybe meta sediments, something like that. Uh, that was an idea that we just had the other day, that could be that. Um, but whatever's happening here, there's something different about the chemistry or the, the temperature of the fluids here because there's no copper in here, but this is where the gold is and it's this native gold. Um, uh, as little little um, uh, sort of micron uh, to 10 micron uh, uh, inclusions. Other elements, so we do have a bit of gold. Um, so this diagram, so the one line across here is, um, so we're taking a sample and we're um, dividing it, normalizing it to the average hypergene. So uh, all the supergene ones are, as you would hope, um, enriched in copper. Uh, by more than an order of magnitude. Um, selenium as well, a little bit of arsenic uh, and bismuth are all sort of enriched in that supergene process. Uh, but things like zinc, um, nickel and cobalt as well are actually um, leached from um, the ores in that supergene process. So we can see what, what elements are also associated with, with the copper. So we've, we've also got um, selenium and bismuth are our main other, other two. Um, and what Kate was able to do with these is uh, put together a nice little sort of paragenesis and using the, uh, the textures, uh, but also the quantitative mineralogy, um, show how the mineralogy and the um, element deportment uh, and ratios change as we go, um, as we progress through that op essentially oxidation reactions. Um, and although we're going from top to bottom here, uh, effectively the ore deposit, it's the other way around because then we've got um, uh, the hypergene at the base. But we start off with a, a hypergene um, uh, assemblage of chalcopyrite, maybe with a little bit of chalcosite, that we've got copper gain, relative uh, loss of sulfur and iron um as you as the the, the supergene enrichment uh, progresses we got chalcosite in here as the next phase then in comes cuprite uh, and then malachite and all the way down uh, to brochantite uh, right in the final stages so we've got a really nice pattern it's backed up by the textures uh, but also we've got a handle on on the uh, uh what happens to to the elements in terms of things like copper iron uh, and sulfur relative to each other. Uh, and so you can see certainly from let's say stage two where we've got um, first stages of, of enrichment with the chalcosite, copper iron sulfur ratios there. As we continue um, to, to progress that alteration, uh, the copper increases relative to the amount of iron and sulfur. So we're losing iron and sulfur there, but we're increasing uh, the copper up to some fairly, fairly high grades. Um, and this works as well if you stick it on one of these EHPH diagrams, this one from Gilbert and Park in 1986. This is a, a classic one in the copper, uh, sulfur, oxygen space. So 
got pH down the bottom, so neutral is, is in the middle there. So to the left is increasing acidity, um, and this is EH. Um, so going upwards, you are in the, the phase relations here, and we starting off with something that has chalcopyrite in, um, and then we're expanding into chalcosite. Um, covalite, we've got a little bit of covalite, so whether the path comes through covalite into chalcosite, um, or whether it's closer to here and going straight into, or, um, uh, into chalcosite, uh, but essentially we're starting off in probably around about near neutral, uh, maybe slightly acidic conditions. Um, probably will be slightly acidic because you're breaking down sulfides to begin with. And then we um, evolve through the native copper into cuprite, uh, and then the malachite uh, is forming at between pH is 6 uh, and 8. Uh, we're just above the water table there as we go into this really oxidized environment, um, and we're, we're also going into brotion type there, which is where our uh, reactions stop and that's our sort of final stage. So putting that together into some sort of uh, a model of the supergene processes at least, um, we've got hypergene sulfides uh, which are then uh, start, we start to leach that, um, we've got chalcosite forming um, at the expense of chalcopyrite uh, and pyrite is getting uh, oxidized as well. Uh, we're then getting uh, cuprite, native copper, things are progressing. The sort of fingering here, um, that is uh, related to the faults, uh, so structures, but also that alteration. Uh, we're only being able to, uh, to form these reactions where we don't have that carbonate uh, buffering. Um, and then uh, in the upper parts, uh, we've got the most oxidized conditions as we go up towards uh, malachite and then brotion tight and uh, uh, Kate managed to produce this sort of refined uh, model uh, for Katumba but essentially we've got that Katumba fault zone coming down here that that provides the sort of the boundary on the western side um, sorry the eastern side uh, this is west to east looking northwards uh, and we've got a pretty deep profile here we're, we're getting this super gene oxidation down so we're uh, 500 meters or so. We've got a, a really thick leached cap. Um, Katumba is marked by a hill with iron oxides on it. There's actually quite a few of the prospects uh, look quite similar. These little little hills in the area with this iron leached iron oxide caps. Um, so Katumba is one that actually has um, um, some nice copper underneath it. Uh, you can see it at the surface just slightly in one or two locations. Um, and then we've got this uh, main sort of ore shell here of this really high grade um, malachite brochantite uh, ore, which then goes down into some sulfides like chalcosite um, and chalcopyrite. But once you get into that hypergene zone, of course, the copper grades uh, decrease a little bit. And then we've got that weird, unusual little iron uh, oxide zone with our gold. And if anyone's seen anything a little bit like that or has some ideas on and why that may be, that would be uh, most welcome because the idea is that we are, are going to write this up um, as a little paper um, in the coming coming weeks. Uh, so you may be able to see see a bit more of this um, in press at some point. Um, so to summarise, uh, the Mumbwa region um, of central Zambia hosts a number of IOCG type deposits. Um, but deep weathering in the area is caused supergene enrichment um, of them. So we're actually looking at um, supergene uh, oxide ores, uh, which are high grade in terms of copper, but obviously um, with any sort of um, oxide ore, um, there's a fairly complex mineralogy. Um, but hopefully we've done, uh, we've helped to, to, to elucidate some of the details of that um, and using that mineralogy, that automated mineralogy, as ice is really helped. And the gold is separated, we're not too sure why, um, and that super gene mineralization is there unless we've got that carbonate alteration, uh, which as I mentioned is quite easy to, to log in the core, if you've had the core lying out for a little while so that it oxidizes. Um, and the highest grades are in those potassic serocytic iron oxide alterations. 
Malachite is most common in the high grade zone and brochantite and not actually pseudomalachite. There may be some pseudomalachite there. We didn't find any, none of um, uh, Kate's um, uh, uh, elemental mapping uh, produced any significant phosphate. So uh, we think that may be actually brochantite rather than pseudomalachite. Uh, but as I said, that's as a sulfate rather than a phosphate, that's actually a little bit more amenable to any potential uh, leaching um, to, in the processing of it. Um, uh, and yeah, that's all amenable to that acid uh, leaching. So uh, that's the story so far. Um, so I, as I say, most of this is, is um, a summary of that, uh, that, that project that we've, we've just finished and we're writing up now. Um, and so I am happy to take any questions. Uh, if if I can answer them, I will do my best. But also, if anyone's got any ideas about that gold, um, that would also be great. Okay. So <laughs> thanks so much. <laughs> thanks for that. Another another really really interesting talk from your side. So thanks again. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so if anyone wants to ask a question, just raise your hand. I see we already have Pete Siegfried who'd like to answer a question. You can just unmute yourself and go right ahead. Yeah, radio. Um, great talk, thanks. Um, just uh, a, a comment in terms of yeah. the brockentite. Um, oh, yeah. it, it doesn't have an I in the spelling. And oh. it, it's a nightmare. Oh, that, that is, that's my fault, sorry. <laughs> no worries, no worries. It's a nightmare <laughs> when it comes to actually the whole um, first stage of any acid leaching. Ongan Yamai Nauten Vintuk had a similar problem where for years people had identified all of the yeah. secondary copper to be malachite easily yeah. leachable and they could never balance that with what they were doing because a large part yeah. was broken tight. But yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, my, 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 I've got two questions. One is um, okay. you've got like three, 400 meters of, 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 of weathering. I mean, that's yep. a, that's a incredible thickness and I don't think recognized much in that part of the world. And so my, my, my question would be at sort of what sort of age you were seeing the development of this. I mean, I see there's a number of events, but, you know, that does, does yeah. um, um, need a, a, a special kind of uh, climatic control to achieve those kind of, of depths, um, even given next to the fault zone. And then, then secondly, I mean, you've got all this appetite in the, in the hypergene stuff. Where, where's it gone, the phosphate? Okay. So for... Right. For first question then, um, when does this happen? Not really sure about that, um, but you're right. It is a very deep weathering profile. So maybe it's a, some exceptional circumstances whereby it, it, you've had favorable conditions for a prolonged period. Uh, but yeah, it is next to that fault. And there's a lot of permeability maybe within that. Uh, the appetite, um, I showed you some pictures there because there's beautiful eye candy, though, those, those massive appetites. Um, not not all of the not all of the hypergene ores have that appetite in it's just a few um, sections but that is a good point um, there is a lot of phosphate obviously in that uh, in those zones where the appetite is so maybe there are some pockets of um, uh, of pseudo malachite or maybe something else where the phosphate is has gone uh, or maybe the phosphate doesn't go into the supergene zone maybe that's leached out I'm, I'm not sure but we certainly the sections that we looked at we had no real uh, large amounts of phosphate of, in, of uh, phos phosphorus yeah and as being an integral part of an ICG as well um, yeah you know, usually yeah yeah where, where, where has it gone yeah d d don't know or at least in, in, in the sections that we've looked at within the supergene zone, it doesn't appear that it's either stayed there or even been enriched in that. Um, so, gotcha, gotcha. Righto, thanks so much. All right, cheers, Pete. I'll check my spellings. <laughs> worry. Thanks, Pete. Um, are there any further questions for Dave while we have him? You can just raise your hand. Uh, hi there. Oh, there hi, you go. Hi, Natalie. Can, can hi, you hear Roger. me? 
Yes, we got you. It's, 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 it's just a question that you, you know, the copper it's more or less the same age as the copper belt some copper or, is, or am i completely wrong it's just interesting that you've got two completely different copper deposits but more or less the same age so is that telling us anything about the source david or is that just a complete nonsense question? well well no that, that i would say is a very intriguing observation actually and, and that has crossed our minds as well so I mean, there's always a little bit of debate as to where the coppers come from in the copper belt, whether it's um, uh, red beds or, or, or basement or something like that. But certainly around that hook granite, that seems like that's a source of copper. And it's coming in at around about 500 and odd, which is uh, maybe a bit late for some of the copper belt mineralization. It depends what you believe. If you believe some of the molybdenite dates, that's around about Pan-African, but... Um, I don't really want to get into a copper belt debate here, but yeah, it, it, it's interesting that there is a potential magmatic source of copper during the sort of 550 to 520 um, uh, period, which has produced copper deposits here, but may, maybe the, the, those fluids could have contributed to something a little bit further north, who knows? <laughs> That might have opened the right can of worms, so I don't know. <laughs> I think it might be a bit of can of, a can of worms because we've got some more hands up here. I've got, there's a question from Paul, you can go ahead. Yeah. Hi, David Howell. Yeah, thank you Hello. for the presentation. Yeah, yeah I, I learned a lot. Yeah, I, want, I just wanted to ask um, on, on projects like this. Uh, what what is the process that you have to undergo when you go into a country and start investigating the minerals? Like, how what, what do you have to do? Which stakeholders do you have to meet? And yeah, thank you. That's my question. I, I didn't catch the end of that. Uh, like, we, we, what stakeholders do you have to meet? And uh, uh, do you have to go to the communities and talk to them? I mean, uh, with what process do you go through when you are going? With yeah, of course. So, um, uh, yes, any, any sort of exploration um, uh, like that, because it's the, the early stages, uh, the first time that you potentially into areas like this, um, we, then yes, of course, there's a lot that there needs to be a community engagement, things like that. Um, I pers from a from 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 what we've been doing because we're from a university we're from the research side of things we've been working with the companies who've been doing that work so um, it's CMI who do all the, um, uh, the 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 work on the ground um, and work with the local uh, communities um, and previous uh, companies who work there as well um, so. I'm not at the front end of doing that because I don't work for the exploration companies. I'm a, a researcher who works in partnership with them. So, yeah, Mpo, I think that's a completely. We could have a whole another topic, a whole another talk on uh, on that kind of thing. Could do, yeah. <laughs> and maybe we'll set one up like that. So we'll think about it. Thanks for that question. Um, we have another question from Craig Blaine. You can unmute yourself and go for it. Thanks, Mandy. Um, I just wanted to comment on Pete's um, statement just around the, the depth of weathering. What oh, yeah. we're seeing there is a, is a very localized, um, very deep weathering that's created by, you know, acid production during the weathering of sulfides. If mm -hmm. you, you know, we've drilled holes a few hundred meters off the main sulfide body there and there the depth of weathering is much, much shallower. So it's a very localized feature there. That's not like a, regional or climatic influence it's purely related to the sulfide weathering on the deposit okay cool thanks craig um are there any further questions for david not the can of worms you hope to open there hey dave well that, that's all right maybe, maybe all the copper belt people are, are, are catching up on the copper belt talks <laughs> online <laughs> or having load shedding might be the case. <laughs> or, or, yeah, they, they don't have any power. So <laughs> that's quite possible as well, either in Zambia or South Africa, uh, by the same <laughs> Yeah. All right. Um, if there are no further questions, uh, last chance, everyone. Um, okay. I'd like to thank you again, Dave, 
for joining us again. We've been spoiled with your talks in the past few months and we really appreciate oh, it. Thank um, you, no worries. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to thank Tacoma Strategies once again for being our sponsors for the month of September. And mm -hmm. we hope to catch all of you in the rest of our talks, upcoming talks. Um, just check out the GFSA calendar and uh, our lunchtime lectures are still ongoing. So join us for those. And we will end this talk now. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thanks, Natalie. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nat. Thanks, Dave. Ciao. All right, cheers. Cheers.